Thank cool. you, Graham. Thanks, Andrew. All right. All right. Uh, hello, welcome. Thanks for coming back. Uh, means yesterday was great. Um, I hope you all had an epic day yesterday. I'm Graham. Um, I can be found there and at Graham Glass on most techie things. If you're looking for a surgeon in London, that is not me. People email grahamglass at gmail.com and go like, hey, and I'm like, I promise it's not me. You can believe me, but they still email back. Um, but yeah, not me. Um, disclaimer. Um, during this talk, I'm going to be mentioning a bunch of tools, a bunch of frameworks, and a bunch of um, stuff that I've used. I've tried to keep it to tools and frameworks and things that I've used as uh, so, so that it's more like realistic and um, less academic or like choose your adjective there and I don't, I don't want to be like a, a talking textbook. Um, and there are a, multi a multitude of frameworks and tool works, uh, frameworks and, and, and toolkits and stuff out there. So what I'm mentioning now doesn't mean it's the best it, and it doesn't mean that there aren't like 4,000 other tools uh, out there that can do the same thing. It's just the stuff that I've used and it's something that's um, scratched my itch for a specific need. Uh, and the other thing is uh, there was going to be no live demos. Like hats off to Carrie yesterday for not only doing it, but um, beating the demo gods. Um, I'm scared of them. They are vengeful and full of wrath. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to be taking that chance. Cool. So why this talk? Um, the, the, the talks that we've had so far have been great. I've really enjoyed them. Um, and they've all focused mostly on a specific tool or one sort of um, quite narrow and, and, and specific area. This talks more about um, how to get started if you're, if you're a software developer and stuff. How, how do you get started along your journey of getting into DevOps? And, and how do you um, kind of, where do you look? What do you do? And what are the, your, your first steps? Often if you sit here and you're like, oh, I want to get into DevOps and, and there's a talk on Kubernetes or something. It's like the first few minutes you're like, cool, that makes sense, that makes sense. And then you're totally out of your depth afterwards because you've, after the first five minutes, because you've never used that tool. You don't know what it is and where it's going. So I'm trying to say like, you know, let's, let's get going. And I'm trying to bring um, like what I've learned over the last 15 years of, of software dev um, for various, uh, various levels of complexity. I've, I've, I've worked at startups where there's very little planning and there's very little direction and all the direction drops um, and changes at the drop of a hat to the big corporates where, you know, things are set in stone and they're set six months, <laughs> six months ahead of time and you just don't have a choice and just Jira is everywhere and it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> And by corporates, I don't mean tech-focused corporates or corporates that um, are th that have like a, a very strong tech lead and, and they, they're focused on tech. I'm talking about like proper corporate corporates where the CFO and the CEO, they're, they're really in charge and tech is kind of like a, a side thing. Um, as a, as a, like a sort of a, a segue, I still remember a, a talk by Maggie Jo at ScaleConf in 2015. She spoke about uh, sharding the databases at, at Etsy. And I remember her saying that they were giving six months to plan what they were going to do and then another six or seven months or something like that to implement it. And I just remember being so jealous, thinking I've worked at companies that during that same time period, we've gone from product inception to development to deployment to refinement to we're not making money, oh my goodness, um, pivot. Oh my goodness, runway's about to, okay, cheers, uh, we're closing the doors. Thanks everybody, it was fantastic. And uh, it's, you know, it was just such a, uh, I was so jealous and it's such a different mindset. Uh, what a ride. So, um, yeah, what, 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 what's the goal here? So I think over, the, o over these last 15 years, I've, I've picked up on some software dev trends and, and ideas. Um, dabbling in DevOps and, and doing it as I need. And I'm, I'm trying to say to you, hey, these, these, are, these are good ways to go. So it's going to be more from a software developer's point of view than a DevOps or an SRE, like the normal SRE point of view talk. Um, and the reason I think it's relevant is because I think that a lot of what makes good DevOps culture 
um, is good software practices. And I, I think that there's a, there's a big like overlap and, and mesh that, that can happen there. I know where the AWS guys, the, yeah, he disagrees with me, but that's cool, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I specify I specify good software practices and not common ones. As sadly, in my experience, uh, good is not common. Um, cool. So, so why should you care? And that 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 should be a care bear. But there are no Creative Commons no attribute uh, care bear pictures. It's copyrighted. So just pretend it's doing the care bear stare. Um, <laughs> So you should care for selfish reasons and for altruistic reasons, uh, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, selfish reason, this is what you want your deployment to be. The, you want to be that dude, like during a deployment. You want a peace of mind. You don't want it to be a special event. You don't want to have to wear special like deployment shirts. It's, um, <laughs> I love you, Mark. Um, you know, it, you should be able to deploy any time. Day or night, <coughs> deployment shouldn't be like, oh, this is a special day. Okay, oh, I'm going to be at work till 3 a.m. It's a nightmare. It's no, it, you shouldn't care. You shouldn't know. It's just like it, it's going to happen. And for more of the altruistic things, I think this last year, maybe more so than most, or maybe it's just been way more public. It's kind of felt like it's been a dumpster, a dumpster fire. Um, in, in terms of security and the amount of leaks and the amount of hacks that, that have gone on. And I think that a lot of uh, the hacks and stuff that have happened have been avoidable if people had just followed decent security practices and, and, and um, yeah, done some of the things that I'm going to speak about in this talk. And um, I think, yeah, we should, should care about that. Um, you should care about um, your customers' data and privacy as much as you care about their user experience using your software or your application. Um, I think we often forget the real-world implications of what happens if there's a leak. You're like, oh, it's a leak. But depending on how sensitive the, the, the information is, it could be somebody stealing your credit card details, you know, taking your money. There could be very personal, like, medical uh, information. There's, there's a bunch of stuff. And, we should, as, a, as an industry, actually care about that and try and be better. Um, yeah, so like closer to home, we've been nailed as South Africans by these ones recently. And I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but since the Deeds Office one came out, I have been getting so many spam loan application emails. And it's, I mean, it, they have real world implications. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's there. Cool, so what is the, the holy grail of DevOps? Um, I think it's twofold. I think, first of all, it's continuous integration and continuous deployment, meaning continuous integration that, um, uh, blah, 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 sorry, continuous deployment that's it's, you're working when, when a um, pull request is merged into master branch or whatever you call your always clean branch. Um, a build process is kicked off, it's ready to go, it builds everything it needs to do, kicks off maybe a Jenkins pipeline or whatever tool you're using, and it throws it up into production, and it's there, and you get the zero downtime deploys. So either you would take out an instance from a load balancer, update the code on that instance, and then when it's finished, put it back, or spin up new ones and then cut off the old ones as you go. Um, but that, in my mind, is what you, you really want to strive for with CI, CD. Um, and then auto-scaling. So in theory, you want an inf uh, infinite amount of auto-scaling. You want to have a service that sits there, and regardless of the amount of traffic that hits it, it is able to handle it. It scales up nice, um, handles the traffic, and when the traffic goes away, it it shrinks itself down so that you're as cost effective as possible. You're only having the resources running that you actually need. Cool, so what's the actual reality of life? So it, probably very different for a lot of you that are working in corporates, but as a, a, like a loan developer and a consultant and or a keyboard gun for hire, um, when you go into a company, it's about features. People want features. 
and if the culture of the company is not um, DevOps minded and infrastructure is not an important thing and it's never been thought about, it's really, really hard to try and fight for the time um, to do things properly and build up these um, pipelines and stuff. They, they don't see the value in it if you don't have um, buy-in from the higher-ups. It's, it's a difficult situation. And yeah, depending on the complexity of where you're at, it's, it's gonna be very difficult even with a small team and as a lone guy, it's, it's gonna be close to impossible. So it's not all bad news. Where do we start? How, how, how do we begin our journey? If, if what we're doing is getting paid for features, where do we start? Um, I think like all things, it's baby steps. Um, one step at a time and I'm just gonna run through a few things that I think are important and I think that they put you in good standing for, um, for, for moving forward and, and, and getting uh, ready to have a decent DevOps culture in, in, in your organization or on the project that you're working on. So the first thing is tests. Um, tests are not sexy and most devs I know do not like writing tests. They think they're a waste of time. I used to think that. Um, also, most people do not do TDD. Um, it's, it's, it's spoken about and people are like, kind of like, yeah, we, but tests are often like the stepchild and it's, it's just done later on. Um, but if you're striving for a true CI/CD, tests are essential. You can't have something that kicks off a build process and once the artifact's built, deployed to a server and you relax and think everything's great if you've not tested it. I mean, that's just madness. It's, yeah. And yesterday, Yaku spoke about the need to teach the devs to, to write tests. I think there's, and I, and I definitely agree with that, I think there's also a need to teach the devs and, and people as a whole the benefit of tests. Um, just the, the feeling of safety that you get if you run an entire test suite and it passes, you're like, oh, you, you just, there's a warm fuzzy and you're like, I'm not stressed about this deploy. Uh, it's, I'm fairly certain things are not gonna break. Whereas if you don't have test coverage, it's a, it's a, it's a coin toss. It's like, who knows what's gonna happen. Um, and do not underestimate the, the value of integration tests. I've seen projects where you've had close to 100% uh, test coverage with unit tests and they still balk. Um, integration tests like cool you, this class and your individual units might all be very happy and work great but this one does not speak to this one because you have not tested your integration tests so little tip there if you if you have like a web front end or a, a rest api or something something like selenium and postman they're fantastic tools to use for writing um, tests that are going to test your entire system as if a user's hitting it so that you know that everything's working. Your, your routing, your, your logic, your DB connections, the caching, whatever it is. It's testing it like a real user. And I think those kind of tests are really, really valuable. Okay, so document everything. So following up what Carrie said um, yesterday, I think it's really important to document things. Uh, if you're building an obscure package from source or you, you need to configure something and it's bizarre, document it. Because like Harry said, you don't wanna go and, and Google that again. And by document, I don't necessarily mean like, oh, just, just put in a, 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 an entry in the company wiki or a little document. Um, you can actually document it as a, like a YAML file. So I use Ansible for um, automation stuff. And when, as I'm busy doing something, I'll start and I'll have my text editor open and I'll start putting in the lines. I was like, okay, this is what I did. Okay, so that goes in the line of YAML. And yes, at the end of, of the day, the, it's YAML, so it's not perfect. I have to still like play around with it a bit so that it'll actually run as a playbook. But you've got like 99% of what you did already there. And then with a few more minutes of effort, you've now got that process automated. There's a playbook and it's fantastic. Um, Recently, I had to get a Linux server to speak to an MS SQL database, and I'd done it years ago, and I remember the pain. It's like free TDSD and open um, 
Unix ODBC and just the settings and the little tweaks and it's very, very finicky. And I was not looking forward to it because it was years ago. I had not documented it and I was like stressing out. And then fortunately though, uh, Microsoft have released a nice uh, little dev packages and so it was just like, cool, pull it down, install it. I was like, fantastic, thank you Microsoft. Um, but you know, it doesn't negate the point that document things because there are gonna be times when you need to run something again and if it's been documented and especially if it's been documented in a, like an orchestration or a, an automation system, it's like fantastic. It's, you, you don't have to go and deal with that again. Cool, so um, faithful build environment. So I, I like to say that this one's confirmed because Mark spoke about it yesterday. So sample size of one, no confirmation bias, but com confirmed. Um, yeah, automate your, your local uh, environment. It's such a pleasure just to be able to spin up something quickly that emulates or is exactly the same as your live environment. I mean, if you're, if you're deving on a Windows box and you're pushing to a Linux box, things are gonna be problems. Same as if you dev on a Mac, and you're pushing to a Windows box, it, it's, you know, don't, don't do that to yourself. Make sure that your dev environment is the same as your production environment. The other thing is, pin your packages, whether it's apt, yum, npm, uh, pip, pin your packages. Don't be the guy that just goes, oh, I'm just using this. Because point releases aren't supposed to break things. People are like, yeah, but they do. Um, and, and finding that is a pain. It's like, but it, it, it works right here, and I've just, and you're like, yeah, but a new point release came out. Like, just pin your packages so that that's one less thing that you have to try and figure out when things go wrong. It's like, what version is running where? It's like, the version should be the same regardless of the, the instance it's running in and the environment that it's running in. Okay, so this one's fairly obvious. I, I mentioned it earlier, same OS and same version of the OS as, as prod. So, I mean, you're like, oh, but how does that work if you're running this? So there are loads of tools. Um, I'm fairly old school, so back in the day, I used to just run like a Linux instance in VirtualBox, then came along Vagrant, and this was like fantastic. I can just spin up these boxes, regardless of my machine, and I just make sure that I've got the exact same ISO that was installed on um, the server, and we're like, cool, we're running the same version. Um, I still think that it's, I still use Vagrant quite a lot, mainly because I've just got years and years of experience using it and I've also got a lot of provisioning scripts that I've written over the years for, for different environments and different things. But more and more moving kind of towards Docker, it's much, so for newer projects, spin up a Docker instance is much lighter um, and uh, you, can, you can have the idea of the container, you, you, can, you also get to the point where it, you can have a much more faithful um, representation of production where you can have each service running in its own Docker container instead of having like everything running on one vagrant. So you'd have like your DB and, and your Nginx and supervisor running G-Unicorn or whatever your stack is running just in one box. You can now start splitting it out in the same way that it would be split out in your production environment. Um, I mean, you could spin up separate Vagrant instances for each of those things, but that would be ridiculously heavy. So yeah, using Docker and then Docker Compose to get them to talk to each other, um, it's, it's much, much easier. <coughs> All right, databases. So yeah, they're great. So, are you laughing about the conversation from Thursday uh, or Wednesday? So yeah, I was called old school because I still really like SQL databases, and Quirbus thinks every NoSQL database is about caching. <laughs> You're just like, oh, that's a, that's a good cache, that's a good cache. Um, so, you know, whatever. They're still, rele uh, still relevant, you, you know, you've got, you got good tools, why, why, why not use them? So the first thing is, it sounds stupid, but use the same database and the same database version in development that you use in production different SQL syntaxes, different bugs. Um, once again, it's like, it's one less thing that you have to worry about when you, when you push your code to production. You go like, why is it broken? This works perfectly fine here. And it's like, yeah, well, thing. Um, another, another big issue, another thing that people do is use something like SQLite, and especially if you've got like 
quite, quite a lot of RAM. You might do like a SQLite in-memory database to run your tests because it's like super fast and it's fantastic. Um, and that's great if you're not testing your database and your database migrations and anything to do with your DB because, cool, you just want something fast, you want your stuff up there and you can, you can run through your front end or your APIs or whatever it is, but if you're trying to test the database, that is not going to be faithful. Like, the way SQLite uses locks and, 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 and table relationships compared to Postgres, they are very, very different and you will get bitten proper if you do that. Um, yeah. So this is one of the biggest points that I want to stress, and I think it's because it was something that bit me when I was a junior dev, um, and it still haunts me, is test your database migrations like your life depends on them, because they really do. It's like a code revert in production is nothing compared to a schema revert. Like, trying to revert a schema on a production environment is it's just really horrible, and you don't want to have to go through that. Um, like, as uh, the, the quote that Joe you yes, used yesterday, I just thought it was great. It says, it's much easier to fix your problems before they become glue-covered problems. And that's the thing, is rather test your migrations in development before you go into production, because if you can find, oh, I've got a problem here, it's easier to fix. Once it's in, in, uh, in production, that's a glue-covered problem. Like, that's proper. Like, good luck. Um, and try as best as you can to emulate um, production traffic. So not necessarily size, because that's all often not always practical, but at least the scale. So if you have whatever your scale down um, environment is for development compared to, to production, take the subset of that data and or that traffic and, and run that. Reason being is sometimes you'll run a migration and you'll be like, hey, this is rad. It takes one second or five seconds on my environment, uh, on my development machine. You run it in, protect, uh, in, in production, and you're like, okay, the data is a bit bigger, so that's why it's taking a bit longer. And then after like the first minute, you're like, it's probably just the data. And then like after like 10 minutes, you're starting stressing, and then you realize like we have problems. And you go and look, and there's, because you've got deadlocks, and you've got processes running, and it's just that, it, it, you, did, you didn't catch that in, in development because you didn't have that traffic running and those um, calls to the DBs. So that, I mean, yeah, what, like I said, is like locks lead to timeouts, timeouts lead to downtime, and downtime leads to sadness. So <laughs> test that. Cool, version control, everybody's favorite. Um, so you really need to have the idea that master or whatever you call your always kind of clean branch is that it's always in a deployable state. I've worked at a, a few different places where people would commit directly to master with whip commits. And you're just like, yeah, and if we deploy from that? Um, so. If you used to, anybody here ever used SVN? So yeah, back in the day, I, I understand why you didn't use branches. If anybody ever tried to merge SVN branches, that, that, that was, you basically, it's like, cool, we're either gonna spend the day doing this or we're just gonna copy past the code, put it into places and just kill the whole thing, check it out and we're just gonna go, oh, this goes here, this goes here. It was easier. Um, but with Git, branches are cheap, they're easy, there's really no excuse not to use branches. Use branches for features, use branches for bug fixes. It's fantastic to have like a permanent, always clean, always ready um, environment um, that you know at any time I can just uh, branch off that, do this little hot fix, merge back into it, and we can push it out into production right now with not, ha not having to worry about what features are people working on, is this broken, like, what other developers are doing what. Um, it makes your life so much easier. Um, oh, my slides were one behind, I apologize. Tag on release. It's, it's easy, it's simple, it doesn't cost you anything, and the great thing about it is that if, if something goes wrong and you're in production, there's no like, I mean, yeah, you can go back in your history and, and see, okay, at what hash should we pull down? It's much easier just to go, this was the last hash, uh, this is the last tag that we released and we know it was working here. Okay, quickly, let's just revert back to this tag until we fixed 
what's going on. Um, it's just something that makes your life easier and it, it really, it's no effort at all, but you'd be surprised at how many people just do not do it and don't care. Um, Pre-commit hooks. Uh, I really like pre-commit hooks for my Git repos just to do simple things like run a linter. I mean, yes, your IDE and I'm not even going into IDEs. We're not talking about those. But whatever IDE you use generally would be linting as you go. But it's good to, to have something that will just go over, lint, lint all your code, um, and then possibly run your tests, maybe a subset of your tests, or if you're really cool, like, uh, and don't, and then not too, don't take too long, like run all your tests. And if it fails, sorry, you you can't commit this code. Um, there there are ways where you can tell Git, you can just like say ignore, like don't run run these things, and that's okay if you're working in like a really experimental branch and you you just want to use kind of Git as your backup. You don't want to just have what you've worked on all day, like on your laptop. Then it's fine, but generally speaking, let your git commits, uh, uh, your 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 prehooks run, run through your tests, run through your stuff. Um, it's fantastic. Another thing is pull requests. So if you use GitHub or Bitbucket um, or GitLab, use pull requests. Sometimes it feels really bizarre and odd, especially if you're just like one developer working on a project, like I am a lot of the time. Um, but there is value in a pull request. You're saying like, this is what this piece of work has done, this is why I've done it, and write like a, a sensical pull request, not just like a branch A is going into master. It's like, <laughs> that helps nobody. I mean, it's easy to type, but you're gonna hate yourself later on when you look back and you go like, I, I don't know what branch A was, <laughs> and, I, and I don't know why it went into master. Um, so get into that habit, because you're not, well, yeah, you, th there's a strong possibility you're not always going to work alone. And it, it also gets you into a good habit if and when you work in big teams. Um, uh, because I've worked in, in, in big teams where then you also have the idea that nothing can merge in or land if it's also then um, had a, um, who knows, I forgot the thing, when you review a, a pull request review. There we go. So pull request and you review it. That's the word. Um, all right. A another thing is your your boxes. So if you are running actual instances or something, your boxes should never, ever, 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 ever be able to push code to your repository. If they can, like there's something seriously wrong. Use deploy keys. Like every Git hosting service that I know of has the idea of deploy keys so that the box, if it is pulling from Git, if that's your workflow and not pushing artifacts, it just does a Git pull and it's like rad. Because, yeah, the, when people get onto production and change things and then ha <laughs> ha, it, woo! <laughs> I mean, you all laugh, but uh, if, if that's never happened in your company, you guys are so lucky. Cool. So, security. This is software security. So use a respectable framework. Um, and what do I mean by respectable? I mean, I mean something that is, these are just a few examples there. I mean, there, there, there are loads of, of frameworks. But use something that has a lot of, when, you, when you're looking at a framework, you want to go, OK, first of all, what are the features? Then you want to see, like, how long has it been around? You want to see what is the community engagement. Are there a lot of people that are involved with it? How active are they? Um, maybe you want to look at the corporate backing. That might be important to whether or not you use it. If you like or hate the company, you might be like not touching it or like, oh, that's rad. Um, so there's, there's, there's a few things to look at. But yeah, use something that is popular. Don't go and, unless you have a very specific niche need and you know what you're doing, you don't really, in this day and age, you honestly, you don't really need to roll your own framework. Um, there are a lot of great frameworks out there. Um, and you get so much for free with a framework. I mean, input validation, SQL injection protection, cross-site scripting protection. Um, the ability, and this is a big one because I've worked at places where people thought it's totally fine to do what I'm gonna show in the next slide. But you get the ability to, um, save and then authenticate users' credentials in a safe and proper way. 
If you ever find yourself doing something like this, like, no, just like, stop, that's never acceptable. It's like, that's why you use a good framework because you're never going to need to do that. A good framework is gonna use some kind of hashing algorithm that's done correctly and that, that keeps up to date with the latest standards of, okay, how many iterations should we have? What kind of salt should we use, uh, you know? You don't, and it, look, read up about that stuff, understand about it, it's, it's good to know about it, but you shouldn't need to and don't need to implement that yourself. Like, the smarter people in the world, well, at least for myself, there's smarter people in the world that know what's going on, and they do it, and it's given to you for free in, in a framework, so, so why do it yourself? Always serve your resources over HTTPS or TLS. Um, really, I think there's zero excuse nowadays. The excuse used to be, yes, but it's the overhead on the CPU. Yeah, that's fine. It's built into the CPU now. AES is there. Oh, but certificates cost money. No, they don't. Let's encrypt, or if you're using Amazon, the, the certificate manager, it's free. Uh, there's, there's no excuse to not serve stuff over TLS anymore. Uh, and browsers are even punting that point now. They're like, hey, TLS or GTFO. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, cool, so yeah, another thing is do not roll your own crypto. Like, read up about cryptography and keep reading up about it and learn and, and read books by Bruce Schneier, uh, Schneier and, um, and keep learning and reading until you get to the point where you feel comfortable saying, yes, I'm not gonna roll my own crypto. <laughs> it, if, if you haven't got to that point, you need to read and research more. It's, it, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy and it's, and it's it's almost never the math that's the problem in crypto that's broken. It's the implementation. Uh, great example of web. Like, the, the math was fine. The engineers messed up the implementation. That's why they're these elite people called cryptographers. They know what's going on. Let them do it. Like, we're software developers. Unless you are a cryptographer, then fantastic. But I'm not a cryptographer, so I'm not going to do that. Um, Cool, and then the last thing around um, serving your stuff over HTTPS, something that people sometimes forget is also make sure that you're using the right and the up-to-date Cypher suite. Like, you shouldn't be serving stuff over SSL 2. You should, like TLS 1.1 at the minimum, and make sure that you're not accepting dodgy uh, elliptical curves that have been messed with and stuff. Um, mostly if you're using, if you're using, um, but like certificate manager or, or, or most cloud providers, they, they set that all up for you in the front end. But if you need, if you want to do it yourself and you're doing the, your um, cert exchange inside of your Nginx or Apache yourself, there are places that will give you the nice little chunk of, okay, this is what you should use for the handshaking and stuff. And just keep up to date with how those change and what you should look at. Um, and there's great tools, like there's SSL Lab, it's open, uh, well, it's, it's free, you go there, point, uh, put your site in, it'll check and it'll tell you, okay, everything's cool, or this is a problem, this is a problem, you're, you're vulnerable to this attack, this attack, this attack. Just keep that in mind. Cool, so server security. Lock down your server. Only open ports that you need. So most of what I do is either web apps or RESTful APIs or something, so for me, 443 is always open. 22, there's a star there, we're coming back to that, I promise. Um, you want to disable root login if, you, if SSH is on your box. There is never a reason and never an excuse for you to log into your, your server as root. Um, actually, that would be very interesting. If anybody can tell me there <laughs> afterwards well, if there is a reason, I would be amazed. But yeah, disable root login. Also disable passwords. Only use SSH keys. Like you should never be allowed to get into a box with uh, a password. And then install something like fail to ban. It's or Tripwire, or there's, there's a bunch of different tools. Uh, it just quickly shows you um, if, if people try and like hit into your server after, you can configure it, okay, after like three um, attempts, 
block that IP for the next however long and mail the admin and say, hey, um, it's, it's just a good thing to do. Um, keep your, service uh, your services private. Um, so things like Memcache and Redis, they're not designed to be public facing. Don't allow them to be public facing. They should be tied inside of a VPC or whatever your equivalent is, and only your server is allowed to speak to them. E everything else, the way I like to think about it is that your services should be like the dress code when you go for dinner with your in-laws. You only expose what is supposed to be exposed. <laughs> um, if you do that, you, you're golden. Um, okay, so for the little star, um, I do work for some smaller clients with budgets, a bit of a problem, so it used to be like, yeah, but spinning up like a bastion box is a bit of an issue in something. But I've, I've kind of changed my mind in that. I think it, it, it's a bit more PT, but you can spin up a really small instance. So, you know, disable uh, SSH publicly on your, your service, have a bastion box, you log into that, um, and you can dump, uh, j jump into your server from there. When you're done, spin it down again. If that's too much PT, uh, Tom Bamford, hey Tom, apparently he's watching, we miss you. Um, he wrote this little script, he sent it to me. It's really cool, it just uses Boto, it bashes open port 22 for whatever server you want from the IP that you're currently on. Log in, do it, and when you're done, run it again, takes the permission away, done. So you can also do something like that. Um, it's, it's, that's quite a cool little solution. So in the words of Nmap, you say it best when you say nothing at all. <laughs> um, so no. <coughs> Perfection. That's what you want, you know? Only what you need. Another quick one. Okay, so canary tokens. Who here knows what canary tokens are? Okay, I will explain canary tokens quickly. Um, but so the idea around a canary token is that you create a endpoint that takes a nice long UUID or some kind of cryptographic hash, and when that gets hit, because you know nobody's going to stumble across that. It needs to be big enough and, and long enough that it's it's impractical somebody will stumble across it. You know, oh, somebody's hit that URI and that URI lived in this thing, we've been compromised. That database has been taken or my mailbox has been compromised or something because that's the only uh, like reasonable explanation for why that's been hit. Um, so they're not active protection, but they're fantastic around knowing that, oh, we've been hacked. Uh, if you've seen a lot of these hacks, the guys were like, yeah, we only found out four months later before the data set. Whereas if they had canary tokens, I'm pretty sure the people were going through the data and looking, and if they opened up a URL, because there's a fake URL in there with like my secret financial stuff slash whatever and the username and the password, they hit that, it's like, boom, you've been alerted. Okay, we've got a problem. Um, so you can either roll your own. I mean, it's, it's a fairly simple concept. Or there is canarytokens.org. A service, uh, you can go there and and use that. Cool. So another thing is if when you're using a service which pretty much everybody here is going to have more than one server, you're going to have something behind a load balancer, you need health checks. Now I'm not going to pretend I've never written that piece of code because I have, um, but that's a pretty pointless uh, health check. All it's telling you is that, cool, Nginx is up and your, your URL router for your application works. You have no idea if your database works, you don't know if the caching server works, so you just make your health checks a bit more realistic. Do, I mean, you don't want to put too much PT on your system, um, but you want something that's realistic because if, if this comes back, then your load balance is like, hey, cool, I'm keeping this in, this in rotation because it's fine, but that instance might be balked and traffic's going to it, but your load balancer can't take it out because it thinks everything's cool because you've told it everything is cool. Cool, so that brings us also to uh, another thing to do is your servers and or your containers, you need to get to the mindset, which is sad, but this is what happens. They're cattle, they're not pets. Back in the day, you would do anything to freaking revive like a box metal and you'd try and fix it and it's like how can we save the server but you know nowadays it's like 
it's not special. It's not like Timmy's little hamster. And if, <laughs> it's like, if the cat eats it, you run to the pet store and you buy a new hamster that looks exactly the same. You don't try and stitch it up and like do CPR. And, because the hamster's dead. Um, cool. So, so some of the things that you can do to, to, to make sure that your servers are not special is no stored state. Don't like upload things into TMP for file uploads and stuff. Use NFS, use some kind of blob storage or whatever. And no sticky sessions, like on your load balancer. Don't go like, oh, but we always want the user once they're on this box, no. Because if you need to take that one out of rotation, then what do you do? And then you've got to wait, you've got to drain it and wait for all the users to get off. And so just don't do that. Um, another thing to have is monitoring. Um, so this is just a slide of Flower. It's a monitoring tool for Celery tasks. It's really, really cool just to can see what's going on. But there are loads of monitoring tools. Datadog, Grafana, New Relic, just to name a few, they're, they're there. Have some kind of monitoring. Know what's going on at your system at all times. Exception logging. Um, so Sentry and New Relic I really enjoy for this because if you know where you're going, you can get there quick. If you don't know where you're going, it's going to take a long time. Um, all I'm saying. Um, and yeah, what, what you get from, from good tools like, say, Sentry is that not only do you get like, hey, there was an error, but you get the stack trace. You can see, you see like the state that the server was in. You see the user inputs. You see the requests. You can see everything that's going on. It just makes debugging that much easier. Um, please disable public stack traces. It's, ah, oh, they're just so unprofessional. They're a security issue, but it's also like, I don't want to single out like .NET people, but it's always like the... <laughs> In South Africa, I always see the Microsoft like framework, .NET framework thing. It's just, just turn it off. It's not hard. Just like debug equals false. It's, we're done. Um, and have yourself a nice 500 error page. I mean, errors do happen, but a stack trace is a really crappy 500 page. Um, so logging. Learn to love it. Um, the idea is you want all of your logs in a central searchable place. Um, if you've got loads of servers, it's a nightmare to figure out, like, oh, where did this happen? You're not going to SSH into every single box or, or that and see what's going on. You want to be able to, um, oh, I'm running out of time. You want to be able to know what's going on. Um, and, and, have the, and how you do that is have it all in a central place. So, um, yeah, get them into a central searchable place. I'm very partial to the ELK stack. Um, Elasticsearch is extremely heavy on resources, though. So for smaller clients, it is a bit of a problem. They don't want to pay more money for their searching and their logs than they do on their application. But, you know, but if you like people that have a lot of money, then that's cool. You can just use Splunk and stuff because you've got lots of money. So it's not a problem. Um, but also, yeah, be pragmatic about what you log. You don't want to be logging good debug and your info stuff in production. Um, warning, um, anything from kind of like warnings and above generally is good. and. And yeah, just be pragmatic. You kind of know what is going to give you value and what's not. Don't just log it because you can. Um, no, wow, that slide is stupid. Okay, so sad reality time. Like a lot of you guys work for big corporates or something, and, and this slide might not be an issue for you, but for, for smaller companies, for startups, and for like if you're coming in as a consultant and a loan dev, often money and, and budget is a, is a sad reality. So there are so many amazing tools out there, but you just can't afford to use them um, because there's no budget. Or the tool's open source, but it's so resource intensive, the machine you have to run it on costs more than the machines that run the entire application stack. So then they're like, yeah. So it is a problem, but it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't always keep your eye out for like the latest, greatest, and new tools um, it, just because you can't use them at this place. Maybe at your next place or the next project you use, you could use it. Um, I'm going to touch very quickly on chat ops. So chat ops for... People that have never used it, it sometimes sounds like this magic kind of source and like, oh, what is this thing? It's amazing. It's actually really, really simple. Like, especially for if you're using Slack, you can integrate 
into Slack with a couple of lines of code. It's really not a big, it's, it's, it's not a um, difficult thing to do. But it's just the ability from whichever your, your chat, chat client is, you, you can have a little hook and you can say, okay, server, what is your status? Or load balancer, what is the status? And it can go ahead a little endpoint, do some processing and send it back and say, okay, here, this is what's going on. Or you can go, hey, I want to deploy now. Hey, server deploy. And um, it can kick off your Jenkins pipeline and build and stuff. It's just fun to do stuff. I've got another client where our alerts and our chat ops stuff happens in Telegram. It's, it's actually pretty cool. And back in the day, uh, I used to do it in, in HipChat, but I don't even know if HipChat still lives, but I just thought I'd put it in there. Um, so automation, when it comes to automation, um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of Python. And one of the core devs, Raymond, uh, tweeted this a while back. And I, I think it's a, it's a great principle when you're starting out. Like, use uh, the principle of least force when you're doing something. So if there is a task that you could do when you're trying to automate something with a simple tool like Fabric, where you're basically just writing Python, a little Python function that does, that does something, and that serves your needs, that's fantastic. Use it. That's great. Um, as you get more complicated, maybe then you want to look at a, a thing that has a smaller um, learn, learning curve like Ansible. It's, it's, it's more complete than and Fabric, but it's not as intense as SaltStack or Chef or something. It's, it's great, so you, know, and you can slowly step your way up and build yourself up a toolkit that you can slowly get to the point where you have a whole bunch of tools and you have something that can do all of these automation builds and, and, um, and deploys. Okay, and then auto scaling. The reason I leave this to the last, and that is because, as a, I, I'm not going to be talking about auto scaling. So, because as as a lone developer and stuff, if you're if you're paid for features and stuff, unless you use services like Heroku or DigitalOcean or Elastic Beanstalk, no, you should not use Elastic Beanstalk. Hey, uh, <laughs> hey. Um, they, they can kind of do something, but they're not a good replacement for a proper um, auto-scaling solution like um, Kubernetes or something where, where you've got proper orchestration. They, they can help you a bit, but when you get to the point where you need to start auto-scaling stuff without using just like a, a cheat kind of a Heroku thing, that's honestly the point where you don't have time now as a developer to do that and add features and stuff. So hopefully by that stage, you're in the position where you can either then step over into a full-time DevOps slash SRE role or hire somebody. Um, I don't think uh, that one person can do everything. Um, so cool, so in summary, start small, build yourself a nice collection of functions and tools that make your life easier and morph them slowly over time into a full-on DevOps system. Um, and that's my story. That's it. Uh, thank you very much.